Hello everyone. Hello and welcome from Westminster Libraries. My name is Monica, I work at Paddington Library and we're very happy to have Kate McDonald with us today to tell us all about the forgotten stories of Handheld Press. Kate is a literary historian and the director of Handheld Press and this is the first of a series of talks that Kate will be presenting with Westminster Libraries. The next talk, Recovering Women's Stories, will be on Wednesday, the 7th of July, 5 to 6 p.m. And you would have received the link to book your ticket for Eventbrite with this invite. There will be another talk with Kate in mid-September on LGBTQ plus stories, and one more talk in mid-October about disability through fiction. Do check our website and sign up to the newsletters to find out more about these events. Before we get going, just to let you know that the talk would be approximately 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A, when we will be taking your questions. Do feel free to send us your questions at any point during the talk. The chat features have been, has been turned off, so please type all your questions and comments in the Q&A. The moderators, Susie, Sarah and Lacey, are here with me today, and we'll look forward to seeing your questions. Well, that's it from me. I shall hand you over to Kate. Hi. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I hope you can all see me and hear me. So my name is Kate McDonald. I'm the director of Handheld Press, and I'm going to be talking to you about the stories that we have recovered from the past. This is what I'm going to be talking to you about. So how Handheld Press was born, the stories that we published and who wrote them originally, the triumphs and, well, I wouldn't call them disasters as such, but things that haven't gone quite as well as we might have hoped. And then finally, I'm going to do a bit of talking about covers, book covers, and how judging a book by its cover is really important. But I'm going to start with the beginning. So when I set up Handheld Press, I was working at the University of Reading in the south of England. It was a short-term contract and I had been working for about 16 years before in Belgium, partly as an editor and partly as a university lecturer. It was just an accident of geography and career paths colliding. I also worked as an editor. I had worked, um, I trained as an editor with English Heritage after I took my PhD. So I had this very strange dual career of being an academic editor with a, a lot of specialisms in archaeology and building conservation, but also anything to do with literature and history. And I was learning to become a university lecturer. I was researching like mad and I had a real passion for discovering stories in publishing history. And that all led me to the University of Reading to this six month contract teaching. But this was the only job I had as a lecturer. I loved university teaching. I also loved editing and I was a bit stuck. I didn't really know what to do next with my career. And then one Friday night, it was the end of a long day running a workshop for some colleagues on the book that we were putting together and I was going to be the editor of the book and it wasn't the first book I'd edited for academic colleagues. I did this a lot. One of my colleagues said, you know, Kate, you really ought to set up as a publisher. And I went, pa, what nonsense. Why? Why would I want to do this? I'm applying for academic jobs. And then the next day, Saturday, I got on the Eurostar to go home to Belgium to my family and I had a lot of time to think. By the time I arrived in Brussels, I was already thinking, oh, what could I publish? What would I like to do? And by Monday, I had bought the domain name. It was as quick as that. Obviously, I discussed it with my husband. We worked out the finances. We thought, yep, yeah, this is something that's just so obvious for me to do because I have had about 25, 30 years of experience in editing, in publishing history, in studying, re researching early 20th century literature because that was my wish list. I had a wish list of books that I was desperate to bring back into print because they had disappeared and they shouldn't have disappeared. They were wonderful and I wanted to do it. I wanted to bring them back and so I had to set up as a publisher. So I bought the domain name. That was the first thing I did and I wanted originally to call it Handheld Books because of holding a book in your hand and holding someone by the hand to introduce them to new books. That was the idea. Trouble was, handheldbooks.co.uk had gone, somebody already had it, so I thought, well, I'll just go handheld press, and handheldpress.co.uk was available. 
and by that simple fluke of technological availability, that is how the company got its name. And then, because I needed to start publicizing the company and I needed to have a website and I needed to have an email address, I needed a logo. And luckily, one of my relations, he was married to my cousin, was a type designer. So I asked Andrew Bogue, can you please draw me a logo? And he just flung himself into it. And you can see here, here are some of the early ideas he had of what we should do with handheld press. And, and the logo emerged. After that, about maybe a month and a half later, I was seeing a lawyer. I was seeing an accountant because I had to set up as a limited company and I had no idea how to do this. I've never run a company in my life. I registered as a limited company on the 9th of June 2017. So Handheld Press is now four years old. And almost the next thing I did was buy ISBN numbers. Now, for those of you who don't know, an ISBN number, International Standard Book Number, this is the unique identifier for every single book that's published, either a print book or an ebook or an audio book or any other kind of format. They cost money. I've just looked them up just before starting this talk. If you want to buy one ISBN number, it costs you £89. This is really quite a drawback if you want to do self publishing. But you can buy them in batches of 10 and 100 and 1000 and they get progressively cheaper. So very bravely, I bought 10 ISBN numbers thinking, oh, this will last me a long time. And frankly, it hasn't. I'm well into my second 100 now for lots of different reasons. I also paid for a trademark registration because I'd read a very scary article about um, how company names and logos can be bought. And if you don't have registration, you've got absolutely no legal protection. And at this stage, I was so protective of my baby company. I would do so much to stop anyone else stealing my ideas. I wasn't telling anyone the wish list because I didn't want anyone to grab the book and run with it. I was really paranoid and it just shows how passionate I was in this brand new project that I really, really very protective. And then I needed a designer. Um, luckily in Reading, I quickly found uh, Najaguji, who is a freelance designer. She had previously worked for very large institutions, but she'd gone freelance and she understood exactly what I wanted. She did me a series design of the books. This is how the books look on the cover, the back cover and the inside. We talked about typefaces, we talked about programs for software. And with all that behind me, I set up the initial website and I started tweeting. Now, I wasn't actually very good at Twitter. I'd only been doing tweeting for about a year and a half before that for myself. So I made the handheld Twitter handle, Kate, at, no, at Kate Handheld. I wish now I kept my name off it because it was not my intention to make this company about me or to have my name on it. But I didn't think like that at the beginning. And when you're doing things like this for yourself and there's not really many people to consult with, you make mistakes. And I think that was an early, slightly silly thing to have done, but it's done now. Um, if someone can tell me how to change the Twitter handle with no damage done, that would be nice, but it's okay. And at the same time, I was beginning to talk to authors and I was talking to printers. Now, when I say talking to authors, I was talking to the authors of the introductions because what I really wanted to do was bring books back from the past. And most of these authors were dead. But I wanted our books to have introductions, which were in plain English and genuinely informative, with very little in the way of footnotes. All the references had to be from the public library. You should not need to look into a university library um, subscription to get access to the references in our introductions. They're supposed to be accessible. And another thing, I really wanted to have notes at the end to explain the archaic words to say this was what this word means and this is what this phrase meant and this is where this quotation comes from all of which i find really really interesting and i hope that other readers will too but if you don't you don't have to read them it's fine and in my head i had both my mother who's in her 80s and i had a midwest us american student of literature in their first year at college these are the two ideal readers i was writing the introduction and the notes for when I say I was writing, I did write the introduction for one or two of our books. I wrote the one for the John Buchan novel because John Buchan was my PhD subject. I've studied his work for a very long time. But every single book we do, I write all the notes because I love it. And these are the classics. These are our first four classics. We're now 
I've just received delivery of our 22nd classic, so we're doing quite well with this particular list. The classics are the books that are brought back from the past. And here we have Ernest Brahma, What Might Have Been, that's a speculative novel from the Edwardian period about flying machines and political tyranny. It's also very funny. John Buchan, The Renegades Club is a collection of short stories, but it's classic 1930s Buchan, well, early, early 30s, late 20s. And it's a taste of everything Buchan is famous for. And then we have Desire by Una Silberad, a completely unknown author who I and my colleagues in Germany have done a lot of research on. And I really wanted to bring this book back because I found it fascinating. It's a feminist, again, Edwardian, it's feminism, and it's about learning to type when you come from an upper class family and how you can't get a job because you're just too posh. And then we had Vocations, which was given to me, brought to me by a, a friend of a friend. And this I had never heard of. I didn't actually know Gerald O'Donovan as an author. I knew him for a completely different reason. And I read the novel and thought, this is amazing. We have to publish this. And it's, um, I'll talk about Vocations a little later on. But these are the classics, that gives you a taste. I'll be talking a bit later about more classics that we've done. The other two lists that we do, we have research and we have modern. The two modern titles I'll tell you about now, After the Death of Ellen Kelberg, it's a Danish um, crime thriller set in the winter in, in Skane on top of Denmark, translated into English. And then we have So Lucky, another thriller about disability and queerness by the British, the Yorkshire, Seattle author, Nicola Griffith. After I published those two, I began to realise I simply don't know how to market modern fiction. So those are the only two titles in the modern fiction class um, list that I've done, because modern fiction is a colossal market and I simply don't know how to market it. So I cut my losses and I stopped there. I'm still really proud of both those books. They're both available. Yes, they keep selling, but I'm not taking any more modern fiction because my strengths as a marketer and as an editor are in recovering the old books and also in the research titles. Now, these are biography and letters. That tends to be what they, they focus on. And they're about lives from the past based on scholarship, but again, written in very plain English. So The Aching Heart is a, a book about a, a recently uncovered love affair between Sylvia Townsend Warner and Valentine Ackland and two American women. The Conscientious Objector's Wife is about letters between a conscientious objector in the First World War and his wife. And it's a unique family archive of letters almost, it really is unique because you do not get women's voices from the working class from this period preserved like this. So I thought this is such an important collection of documents to publish. Then we have another First World War, Quaker Conscientious Objector, Letters from Prison. And then we have Valentine Ackland. This is our first commissioned biography. It came out this year by Frances Bingham and it's done really well. We got terrific coverage in The Observer. The Daily Mail reviewed it last weekend as did the oldie last month, A.N. Wilson in the oldie. It's getting a very powerful reception because it's just a stonkingly good book. And then in July, we have Dreaming of Rose, which is a biographer's journal of writing Rose Macaulay's um, biography. So you can see the research focus is about people's lives from the past. It's not fiction at all. And these are our forgotten authors. Now, these are the people we've published who have been forgotten. Some of them are more famous than others, and I would like to challenge you now, if you want to, take a screenshot of this slide, and if you could name every single author and email me the list, I will send you a free handheld press book. So I'll just leave that with you now. I'm not going to name them at all. Um, I'm not going to say where they come from. And it's possible by a little bit of research on our website, you might find out who they are, but we don't actually publish photographs of authors on the website. So I'll just leave that as a challenge. Let's see how many people can take it up and identify these people. The authors are all, as you see, white. This is a real problem when you are trying to produce or recover works from the past, certainly from the British context, there are so few authors who were not white um, and they're just very difficult to get hold of. So that is another challenge I'd like to offer anyone in the, in the audience. If you can recommend to me a work of fiction or non-fiction that's published before the Second World War, actually anywhere in English that you think I should be considering for republication, please tell me about it. 
this is not my strong point and I really need help to try and make our list more diverse. We have a lot of LGBT+, plus. we have a pretty good um, diversity record for disability and ableness, but we're really, really weak. In fact, we're just useless at non-white authors. So again, that is a challenge I'd like to offer you all. Let me tell you now about our triumphs. These are our top five best-selling works. They're all classics. The classics do brilliantly well. Sylvia Townsend Warner, Kingdoms of Elfin. This was our, this came out uh, October 2019. It's a collection of short stories about a very amoral set of fairies, which sounds a bit wishy-washy, but my goodness, they're not, because she was a dark and savage writer. The thing is, Sylvia Townsend Warner began her career writing fantasy. She wrote a novel called Lolly Willows about a downtrodden spinster deciding to become a witch to get away from her awful family. And then she did not touch fantasy for about 50 years. It was only at the end of her life when her lover Valentine had died and Sylvia wanted to write something completely different that was not about the human heart. And so she created these heartless elfins in the kingdoms of Elfin. The stories were all published in the New Yorker um, in the early 1970s. And this collection came out in 1977. And I read it about 10 years later and loved it to bits. So this was one of my top wish list titles. So when I told a friend of mine, John Clute, who's a science fiction collector and a, a sort of a, a, a man who knows everyone in science fiction and fantasy land in Britain and in America, I said, I'm republishing Kingdoms of Elfin. I've got the rights. It's really exciting. And he said, oh, Neil, Neil would be really interested to know that. And I said, who? He said, Neil, Neil Gaiman. Oh, really? Good heavens. Do you think you would like him to give you a blurb or an endorsement? And I said, absolutely. Yes, please. And that is why on a June morning, in 2019, I got an email from Neil Gaiman telling me exactly how much he loved the book. And so we print his endorsement on the back and on the publicity material. And that probably helped to boost this book. Also, when I first presented this book at BristolCon, the science fiction convention in Bristol, I started reading from one of the chapters. And after the first sentence, you could hear a pin drop in the room because the prose and the subject and the way the story unfolded were so arresting to this much younger generation than me discovering Sylvia Townsend Warner for the first time. And that's what I want to do with the classics. I want to bring them to new generations. Our next one, Zelda Fitzgerald, Save Me the Waltz. I had not heard of this, but one of my academic contacts on Twitter said, ah, I want to teach this, but it's not in print. It's such an important book. So I said, here I am, hold my beer. I got a copy from the library, I read it, and I thought this is outstanding. I was also aware that Zelda Fitzgerald was coming out of copyright at the beginning of 2020, 2019, that's right. And I, so, so yeah, that's right, Kingdoms of Elven came out 2018, not 2019. So Zelda, she came out of copyright beginning of 2019. So I scheduled the book to come out then, and I really expected, because she is the wife of F. Scott Fitzgerald, there is a colossal F. Scott Fitzgerald um, industry in the academic world. F. Scott Fitzgerald is always in print. So I just assumed that big American publishing houses, and possibly in Britain too, would obviously bring out Zelda Fitzgerald's only novel. And nobody did. So that is why, two years later, my edition, our edition of Save Me the Waltz, is routinely bought up by American and British universities for their courses, because at last we have a woman's text from the jazz age, a woman's voice, and it's such a, a stunning novel. The London Review of Books really liked it. Times Literary Supplement really liked it. So that I am so proud of. I brought this back and it needed to be brought back because people are just gobbling it up. The middle one, What Not, by Rose McCauley. This is a discovery I made because <clears throat> when I was um, towards the end of my academic career, I was putting together a collection of essays on Rose Macaulay. She's really famous for her novel from 1956, The Towers of Trebizond, and also for her post-Second World War novel, The World My Wilderness. You have to be a bit of a, a, a Macaulay completist to really enjoy and know about the novels that came before that. But in 1918, Rose Macaulay, who was just finishing up working for the Ministry of Information in the war, completed her novel and it was published. And it was a speculative novel of, about eugenics and about birth control and about the Ministry of Brains, which is going to control people and stop stupid people being born so we would never have war again. 
you may recognize some resonances there because Aldous Huxley, the very famous author of Brave New World, which is about eugenics and stopping people breeding with whom they want to, he was a friend of Rose Macaulay's and 14 late years later he pent some of her ideas from this novel, What Not, and put them into Brave New World. The trouble was nobody remembered What Not because it was a commercial failure. It came out and instantly got pulled back again by the publishers because they spotted three pages of potentially libelous material. And so they got her to rewrite those three pages with nonsense. And then they re republished it and it sort of went, mm, yeah, nothing really happened. And it was so different from the rest of her output. She never published anything in the line of science fiction before. She published a lot of satires, but nothing as vicious as this one. So when I was researching this Macaulay essay book, naturally I read everything that she had published. And I read this and was just bowled over by its audacity, its originality, and its st outstanding storytelling. So I was able to get the rights. The Society of Authors administer the Rose Macaulay estate. So I got the rights for this because un unsurprisingly, nobody else knew about the book. Even the Society of Authors had to go back and research it. And I published it with the missing three pages because my friend John Clute, he has the first edition that not even the British Library have. So I was able to put the new three pages that Rose had to write as a footnote and reinsert the three original pages, which show that the libelous material was all about accusing tabloid editors of routinely engaging in blackmail. I don't think much may have changed in the last 100 years. So Rose Macaulay, that was great. I was getting the trade publicity ready for this around about the end of November 2018. And I sent the material to the bookseller, which is the weekly trade magazine for the book trade. So they would publicize the book, hoping they would pay attention to it. And Alison Flood, who is a Guardian journalist who also works for the bookseller, got in touch immediately to say, I want to read the book. Let me have a PDF. The next thing I know, the Guardian have published a story about this lost novel by a feminist, which predates Aldous Huxley. And I had to reprint the book twice before its publication in March 2019. And for most of the three years it's been in print, it has been our bestseller. It's just vertical sales. It's been amazing because it's so good, because it's so important, because it's a discovery. Blitz writing by Inez Holden. Inez Holden, nobody knows about. She was a journalist. She was a, a novelist. She was one of the bright young things hanging out with Evelyn Waugh and his friends in the late 30s in London. But in the Second World War, she was working in various different like, munitions factories. She worked in a hospital. She wrote for the BBC. She worked with George Orwell. And she published several things, but then nothing ever happened. And I had no idea about her until one of my academic colleagues, this school, Will become a familiar refrain. Uh, Kristen Blumel at Monmouth University in New Jersey. She said, You must republish this novella, Night Shift, and her memoir. It was different at the time because they're outstanding. And I read them and I agreed, these are outstanding. So I agreed the rights with uh, uh, Inez Holden's um, cousin's daughter, who is now looking after the copyright. And we brought this book out. And to my great pride, this is the first book of ours that we got into the Imperial War Museum bookshop. They are really, really picky um, because this is a really important set of documents. DJ Taylor described it as crucial documents from the First World War, sorry, Second World War. So this sold really well because of the publicity and because of its innate importance. And our fifth top seller, Women's Weird. Who would have thought that there was such an astonishing appetite for classic supernatural short stories by women of over 100 years ago? I was reviewing uh, a book about British, about weird fiction uh, by James, uh, James Machin, thinking, this is all very well, but where are the women? There are no women in this study, this long book length study of how weird fiction evolved before um, H.P. Lovecraft. And so I talked to Melissa um, Edmondson, who was an academic contact of mine in South Carolina, and said, could I commission you to put together a collection of, you know, supernatural weird fiction by women from about 1890 to about 1940? And she said, here is my list. Because Melissa is the kind of researcher who's been looking forward to these opportunities most of her career. So very easily we put together Women's Weird and the sales again were vertical because 
people really want to read stories, classic stories, which are supernatural, which are horror, which are gothic, which are science fiction. There are so many overlapping uh, genres in, at play in this very early period. So again, a wonderful, wonderful uh, bestseller for us. We were just delighted. Right, I'm just trying to click and get... Ooh, oh, there we are. No, there we are, more triumphs. That is our next set of triumphs. Business as usual. This was, again, a find. I was giving a talk to the Angela Thurkle Society a couple of years ago, three years ago, and the members of the society sometimes bring books from their own shelves to sell, not a friendly little book sale. And I picked up this book, which had a very old sort of a scrappy paper cover on it, and I thought, I don't know what this is. Open it up. Oh, the illustrations. A little later, I will show you the illustrations. This is a, a, a novel told in letters from 1933 about a young woman who's engaged she can't get married for a year because her husband is just too busy so she decides to go to london and find a job and support herself just to prove that she can do it she has worked before but it's the end of the depression work is not easy to find so it's about a single woman in london it's about finding work it's about finding somewhere to live and when you get the job it's about how do you deal with the managers? How do you try and disguise the fact that you can't add up and your typing is atrocious? And what it's like in the working world of central London in the early 1930s. I love this book so much, I nearly missed my train stop when I read it on the way home from London that trip. Finding the rights was interesting because both the authors are now completely unknown. But I did a bit of Googling. And I find that Jane Oliver had been written about in the 1970s when she died. She lived in um, the New Forest and it was a local history society who had written about her. So I looked up the secretary of the current iteration of that local history society. I sent him an email. He emailed back very cautiously saying, well, I might be able to put you in touch with her estate, but could you tell me what you'd like to do? And then I explained and I got the rights um, and I met up with the heir and he was just delighted and very enthusiastic and we brought this book out. I will show you later just how gorgeous this book is in, in, in inside but it was such a success not really because of the advertising or the reviews. This is one of our word of mouth successes. People buy it and then they buy a copy for their mother-in-law, their sister, their best friend. They buy them as presents. My mum has bought three today that I know about to give to people her generation. It appeals to women of all ages. It appeals to people living in London for the first time in their 20s, wondering what to do with their lives and how are they going to survive. It's got so many crossover markets. It's also funny. It's brilliant history. It's authentic. It's authoritative. And it's laugh out loud funny as well as being actually quite moving. So it has everything. This is, I'm just so proud and pleased to have discovered this book out of nowhere. The next two books are kind of sequels. They're more supernatural classic short stories. Again, they've done extremely well. They did exceptionally extremely well at the end of last year because the Washington Post reviewed them both and our American distributors were screaming for more copies because they were running out overnight because the demand was so high. Thank you, Washington Post, for the publicity, but please give me some more notice so I can get the book shipped across the Atlantic. And our most recent bestseller is Margaret Kennedy, Where Stands a Winged Century. Now it's a memoir and it's been, never been published before in Britain because during the Second World War, this woman, who is a really well-known novelist and playwright, she's most famous for her novel, The Constant Nymph, she was writing a diary of what it was like in 1940 as she and her children were evacuated from Surrey down to Cornwall. And then partway through that year, she decided, I've got to write this up. She wrote it up and then she sent it to the States for safekeeping, because at that time, nobody knew how Britain would survive the war. Nobody knew that the Nazis would not invade. And she was determined to keep something of the spirit, the blitz spirit secure. And it was published in Britain by Yale, sorry, in America by Yale University Press. And it went, meow, it just didn't happen. Marketing, wartime, the American market wasn't interested, who knows. But I heard about it about 10, 12 years ago at an academic conference. Somebody mentioned it as a curiosity and I thought nothing about it. 
about two years ago, I was talking to Becky Brown of Curtis Brown, the literary agents, and she said, oh, we have the Margaret Kennedy estate. Do you know anything about where stands in winged century? And I said, yes, I do. Give it to me now because they had the rights. So she sent me a copy and it was just outstanding. So again, I had to republish this. This one has had stonking good reviews and that's really helped. Um, advertising in the, lar the larger literary weeklies and monthlies has also helped, but this one really, really works for so many people because it's so evocative of the war, but it's such a different way of writing about the war. You might know about Mrs. Miniver, which is a classic 1930s account of what it was like as Britain was moving into wartime. It's very genteel, nothing harsh, nothing unpleasant happens. This, where stands a winged sentry, is Mrs. Miniver with the gloves off. It's just terrific. Right, trying to get my next slide. Oh, you don't seem to be able to do this. Ah, there we are, it did work. So I've done that one, I'm now gonna do this one. I won't really call these disasters, they just didn't sell well. So desire and vocations, you've seen these before. They, they, they're basically flatlined. I don't know why they didn't sell. I know vocations was not marketed properly because frankly, I didn't know what I was doing. Una Silbrad is completely unknown. And when I was beginning the company, this was not a sensible time to bring out a book nobody had ever heard of by an author no one had ever heard of from a company no one had ever heard of. So they just flopped and that's such a shame. In the end, they were costing more money for warehousing fees. So we've had to remainder them. If you're interested, I have about five of each in my office and you can buy them through our website. But when they're gone, the whole lot are gone. It's only available then by ebook. The, the middle one, Adrift in the Middle Kingdom, this is really interesting. Um, it was brought to me um, by David Mackay, who translated it. It's a classic Dutch novel from 1932, I think, about an imagined China from 1927, around the fall of Shanghai. And it's an, an extraordinary Bildungsroman of a man escaping from a ship and just entering into China and getting away from the sea as much as he can. It's a travelogue, it's a remarkable portrait of contemporary China, it's got fantasy elements, there are flying monks at the end, and I loved it, and we published it. We were funded by the Dutch Literary Fund uh, for the translation fee, so that was a, a sign of their enthusiasm for it. And it's not really done that well because I don't know why. I wish I knew why, because it's so good. Until two weeks ago, suddenly the sales started going up. And I wonder, has somebody somewhere reviewed it positively? But I'm selling more. I sold more in the last two weeks than I have in the last year, which is really odd. And I really wish I knew why. So maybe this will not be a disaster after all. Maybe it will gain the audience it deserves because it's a wonderful story and it deserves to be read. And then finally, we have Ellen Kelberg and So Lucky, who have sold, but honestly, and just not very well. I am going to keep them on because they're saying uh, selling, they're not selling poorly enough to call, to justify remaindering, but they're brilliant. I just wish people would buy them. If you want thrillers, these are our best thrillers and they're just so good. Now I'm going to tell you in the last 10 minutes or so, five, 10 minutes, but about cover research, this is how we do it. I get most of my covers from the Mary Evans Picture Library, which supplies an awful lot of vintage graphic design and it holds a lot of um, estates, of uh, photographic estates and lots of archives. I went to them for the whatnot cover saying, I need a couple looking at a newspaper and can you make it 1920s, like early 1920s? And so Lucy Gosling, who, run, who she manages the archives, she sent me a, a collection and this is a screenshot of what it looks like. And I went through and I thought, not this one, not this one, but oh yes, that one. So the one at the top, top right, squaring the dance circles, it's a cartoon from a magazine and it's mocking the new fashion for crosswords. But that doesn't matter. You've got two people dancing. You've got them looking at a newspaper. It's clearly a 1920s. It's absolutely perfect for what we want because all our classics have contemporary cover images. Um, it's so important to have that because they reflect the text and they give you a sense of what people look like, or what the art was like, what the environment was like when these books were written. Here are some more 
covers and how we've got them. So Blitz writing, that photograph comes from the Imperial War Museum um, because we needed a munition shot and the, the spray of light from that welding equipment was so strong, we had to use this. And so Nadja, our designer, she cropped it and we chose this particular crop for Blitz. And it just says Second World War. It's really evocative. The conscientious objector's wife, we used a family photograph. It's really creased, as you can see, because it's well over 100 years old. And it's been retouched by our wonderful designer, Nadja. She photoshopped it like mad, got rid of all the creases in the white dresses. And that strange little carriage you can see on the front, this is the little car built for Morris, the little boy of the family, by his father. And this was a photograph taken for the family by one of their neighbours, so they could send it to the father when he was in prison. So it's central to what the book is about. And on the right, we have a full length nude portrait of Valentine Ackland. And this is drawn by Eric Gill, a notorious but an absolutely brilliant artist and draftsman and sculptor. And clearly Valentine sat for him in her beginning of her androgynous phase when she was um, not just coming out as a lesbian, but dressing, cross-dressing as a man. For the cover, we wanted the head and shoulders. We did not want the rest of the, sh sh the, um, the image because if we had had her naked breasts on the cover, everybody would be looking at that. And that's really not what we wanted. The head and shoulders crop is much more effective. We have actually used it. This is an older version of the copy. This is sort of squiggly mark at the top. We've got that photoshopped out as well. But it's a strong image. It shows exactly what Valentine was like. It's androgynous and it's just a beautiful, beautiful drawing. And then we have four more. What might have been, that comes from a typewriter advert um, because the novel is about a woman working in an office as a typist and actually working as a secret agent at the same time. And I also loved it for the strong, high contrast, black, and, black red and white graphic work. Um, is a really eye-catching one. The Exile Waiting. This is a science fiction novel from 1975. And as you probably remember, science fiction covers from 1975 were pretty dreadful. There was no way I wanted to use any of those. So we commissioned original artwork. This is an early version of what the cover could have looked like. Jane Cornwell, who was a Scottish artist, we found each other on Twitter, and I think she did an absolutely beautiful image for this, for this novel, which is about a post-Holocaust, you know, post-nuclear disaster settlement on Earth, and people really desperately want to go to the stars and just get, a, get away. Then we have After the Death of Kell and Ellen Kellberg again. For this image, it's about a woman who dies, and then people working out how did she die. I did not want a picture on the cover of a vulnerable woman, or a woman in danger, or a woman walking away into blackness and shadow, which is unfortunately a publishing norm now. I wanted a naked man in the snow because that's an episode in the novel. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why the novel doesn't sell so well. I don't know. And to find the image, I went to Flickr, and you would be amazed how many pictures on Flickr there are of naked men in the snow. I had a lot to choose from. But I took this one because even though it's not quite a Danish landscape, I think it may be Slovakian or Bavarian, it's pretty evocative of how cold this man was and why, what is he doing in the snow, which is the question that the book invites the reader to come and find out by opening the pages. And finally, we have So Lucky. Nicola, the author, is very keen to have strong control over the covers of her books. And the American edition, which you can see above, they compromised between what she wanted and what the publishers wanted with flames licking the, pit, the, the letters because this is central to the story and the themes. And in the end, this is the best I could do. I wanted a really strong flame image, which I took from a picture agency. It's actually a picture from a fireworks night display, but the flame is a really good one. And it leaves a lot of space for the pull quotes at the top. And it's got good color for a red, white and black and yellow yellow image so from a design perspective it works well but i don't think it sells books because unless you read the book you're not going to know what that cover represents and that's the problem business as usual um this is the last one i'm going to show you i wanted because it's about a department store i wanted a department store and we got the morris owner this is a wonderful magazine from the 30s about people um, about cars um the morris car which was a an oxford car manufacturer and the colours and the cover were just so good, we cropped it and made it the cover. 
interestingly, the back of the book we made bright yellow, and I was so pleased there was a woman in a yellow coat on that Morris illustration because the department store in the novel is Selfridges. And so we wanted the Selfridges yellow to be the back of the book, just to make that connection. Mr. Selfridge himself thought the novel was brilliant back in the day when it first came out. And these are the images. This is my 1960 edition. You can see the beautiful line art by Anne Stafford, which are comic, which are evocative. They give you mood, they give you a sense of environment. And every single one we scanned and we placed very carefully back in the book in the right place. And I think this, these images really helped sell the book in a good way. And that is it. I'm now gonna hand you back to Monica. And if anyone has any questions, please ask. I would be very happy to talk to you. Thank you, Kate. That was wonderful. And we do have a few questions. Okay, don't need to keep typing. I'll just uh, read you a few. The first one was from Anne Welsh, and it was regarding Twitter that you mentioned at first. And she she's saying that she just checked, uh, and someone else says Nuffle that had handled press. But you might be able to get in touch and um, you can change. She's giving you a little bit of advice. Oh, that's and helpful. she's happy to send instruction. We have an email here, so I will forward that to you. That and is she, within brackets, she says that her help will be free, obviously, because you have produced so many books that she loves. Oh, that's nice. What a kind thing to do. Thank you. I look forward to being in contact later on. Next is a double question by uh, Caroline. Where do you find the lost stories that you publish? And do you spend a lot of time researching in archives? <laughs> <laughs> I do spend a lot of time reading. Um, the thing is, I've been researching 20th century books and reading for about 30 years or more. So I have a lifetime of experience. I know the area really well. I know the field. I've been, I spent my life in secondhand bookshops rummaging. So I know the authors and I know when I come across a name, if that name is new, um, think, why have I not heard about this? Right, home in on that one. But not every book is worth publishing. And actually there's often a very good reason why books don't get republished from the past because actually they're not very good. They're not readable anymore. They might be so full of, um, words and phrases and attitudes we can now find offensive that they're not even popular. I mean, we couldn't publish them because they wouldn't sell and they shouldn't sell. So there is, is a winnowing process. But I, yeah, I do spend a lot of time reading books. However, it's really easy to spot a book that won't work. It's usually in the first three pages. So I get through a lot of books, but I don't get past the first chapter of most of them, which does speed it up. I'm not reading, I mean, if I know straight away that this won't do, I won't continue because what's the point? I have a lot of books to get through. But it's a joy. I love it. The London Library has been an absolute godsend in lockdown. Um, normally, I would get my books from my local library network, which is exceptional, or from Interlibrary Loan or even the British Library. But London Library has been able to send me books so I, I can actually get my hands on them. And I have made some real discoveries. Um, yeah, so a lot of reading and thank goodness for libraries. Thank you. Next question is uh, from Anonymous. Please, could you tell us how you go about getting the rights to publish the stories that you find? And also, the, the person is also thanking you for bringing all these wonderful stories out of obscurity. Right. How do I get the rights? Well, the first thing is you have to find the literary estate. Um, and this just takes a bit of research. There's a website called the Watch, um, Watch Pro Project run by University of Reading and uh, the Harry Ransom Centre in Texas, which has a pretty extensive archive of the current um, representatives for dead authors. But my authors, the ones I tend to want to publish, they're so obscure they won't be on that database. So I have to look at bibliographical entries and biographical entries and things like the Oxford Dictionary of National Bi of Biography. I look at Wikipedia and see where that will lead me. I ask my friends. I see who has published that author more recently and ask that publisher, have you got a contact? Um, and sometimes it is pure serendipity, like this Google search I did for Jane Oliver. I found this 1970. Um, local history article and that led me to the air you just it's a detective work 
Um, and it does take quite a lot of doing. Um, I think that, yeah, the, the Jane Oliver and Stafford, that was the most elaborate route. It has been easier um, a lot of times. And quite often I will just go to the Society of Authors and say, do you know? And they'll say, well, of course, and you need to go to this place. Sometimes it's as easy as that. So it depends. Next is Melissa saying that she's absolutely delighted and excited to read this. Devoured Hogarth and Virago Press as a classic student and used to scour book stacks for secondhand hardback anthologies. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just for one story, I didn't have to complete, uh, to, co to complete my collections. Mm -hmm. And the next is Paul. What percentage of your books are ebooks, and do you publish the same book as a physical book and an ebook? Oh right, well all our all our print books exist as ebooks, and there is no difference apart from the ISBN number. So even the ones with illustrations and photographs, they are in the ebook as well. So there there is no difference. Most of our books are also available through the RNIB as um, for for partially sighted readers. So the RN, the Royal National Institute for the Blind, they have processed most of our books for their own collection, but I think you have to register with them to get, get access to them. But certainly e-books, exactly the same as print books. Next one is Molly. Do you sell social history books, Hans Norton in particular? Um, sorry, what, what in particular? Hans Norton. Hans Norton, I don't know the name. I think for social history, it's difficult to, to justify republishing a work of history because it is out of date. And as a historian, I'm pretty keen on having up to date history in print and not, I mean, uh, maybe classic works of history or Herodotus, for example, he's always good, good for a read. Um, I think it would depend. I'd have to, I'd have to read it and see, um, but re, recovering history from the past and representing it as a new edition i don't think there's a market for that because it simply wouldn't sell and that is an important criterion i have to consider that caroline is asking where do you find the lost stories that you publish you spend a lot of time oh sorry i'm sorry you've had I'm that just... one I'm sorry, it's, there is another one from Caroline. Sorry, Caroline, I've read it twice. What have you found to be the most effective way to market these books? Do you have a particular target audience? Um, it's interesting this, because the marketing always comes from me. I have to absolutely love the book, because then I can enthuse about it to the right people. And sometimes the right people will be my children's age, sort of early 20s. Um, in a science fiction convention and I need to introduce them to these fabulous fantasy writers and sometimes they will be women much older than me who really need to know about this phenomenal novel about a department store in London and, and a book a, a library so <clears throat> as I work on the book it becomes obvious to me that this is this market will be interested or I must try this market what has really surprised me is like the Valentine Ackland the biography that came out last month it's about a lesbian communist cross-dressing poet from the 1920s who did not live in London and who drove fast cars and smoked and drank too much. She has been reviewed in the, well, she's going to be well, in the Daily Mail and the Oldie, which are not left-wing publications by any stretch of the imagination. And I do know that the Telegraph is going to be reviewing it when they can get to the top of their pile. These are right-wing Tory presses, and I'm amazed that this subject, this you know, Valentine Ackland, is appealing to them. I'm delighted, my word, I'm so glad of the publicity, but this, this came out of the left field for me. I did not expect that, that interest from those quarters. So you never can tell, that's the other lesson. Next is uh, Anonymous, and thank you for such a brilliant talk. Have you found it accessing publicity and reviews? Has anything surprised you? How have you found accessing publicity and reviews? Sorry. Um, publicity, yeah, publicity tends to sneak up on me. So when the Washington Post published a book review of British Weird and Women's Weird 2, I knew they'd had a review, copy each. I had no idea it was coming out. And then it just happened and suddenly the sales exploded. It was the same with whatnot. So 
the really big sales take me by surprise because I never get noticed. And then sometimes when I think a book is going to do really, really well and people are going to be so interested, not a blind bit of notice is taken. It's very unpredictable. And also the weirds, our supernatural series, the, the anthologies, Melissa Edmondson, who is the editor of most of them, she has a following on Twitter, which is about four times the size of handheld's following. But if I put out a book cover with her name attached and she's tagged, we will get over 100, no, like 10,000 impressions really quickly. So there is an appetite in some quarters for some of the books we do. And I know I can rely on that. But for other books, I don't know. It's, it's strange. The older we get, the more books we do, the more clear it is which are our strengths, where we can be assured of a strong response and good sales. And that helps us understand if it's a wise decision to try a different route, which has got nothing to do with that, or whether we should try a piggybacking approach, saying, well, they like this, and therefore they're going to like that too. It's a curious practice. The thing is, I have no background in trade publishing. I trained at English Heritage, which is civil service publishing for the academic market. So all the marketing I'm doing, I have taught myself. I'm not too bad at it. Entrepreneurship runs in my family, so it's clearly coming from somewhere. But I've got I have no real idea how publishing marketing works, how it's supposed to work. Maybe that's an advantage. I don't know. It's working most of the time and I'm pleased. And again, from Anonymous, it sounds like you have a strong emotional attachment to these stories. Does this interfere with the need to make a profit from publishing? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, yes, it does. My, my husband and I, he's the finance director and he's in charge of everything to do with money and numbers. That helps because I'm not that good at numbers. I'm good at words and organizing. So when I start saying, I really, really want to publish this book, I really want to do it. And he goes, OK, prove it. Tell me why. Justify it. And he'll sit back like that. And I have to argue that book's cause. So I have to come up with at least two or three markets that I can convince him the book will sell him. I have to say it's going to be economic to produce because either the rights are available and they don't cost much or it's out of copyright. So it's free. There are no royalties to pay or the cover image, we don't have to pay the cover image fee because we happen to have a book cover that will do. Uh -huh. So I, I have to argue the economic and the I have to prove the marketing will work. And when I'm doing that, I listen to myself and I think, do I actually feel this 100%? And sometimes in trying to articulate to another person why I think it's going to sell, I will actually say, actually, no, I don't think this is going to sell. And I have... I have decided, no, I'm not going to do this after all. But you have to articulate it. And it's so helpful having my husband, who I've been married to for 27 years. We know each other exceptionally well. It's really good to have that close relationship as a, a foundation for how we will decide to take a book on or not. Um, when I was coming to the beginning of my realization that I could not market modern fiction, I was looking at and encouraging so many new works of fiction that were brilliant. And I couldn't work out how to sell them. And I should have been listening to myself much earlier because if I don't know how to sell them, if I don't have that emotional, emotional oomph, then there is no point. Now, just a thank you from Melissa. Thank you, Kate and Handel and Monica and the team for a fascinating session. And Molly, thank you for a very interesting talk. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, everyone, for your questions. Just wanted to remind you that uh, shortly we will be sending an email with a link to our feedback form. And we're always grateful for feedback. So it's really nice uh, to be able to pass on your comments to your speakers, uh, apart from the ones that you've listed in the chat, in the Q&A today. And there will also be another email in the next days with a link to the recording of this event, which will be available online for seven days. Uh, so I hope you will join us for the next event. As I said, it's on the 7th of July, and it's Recovering Women's Stories. Um, at 5 to 6 p.m. The Eventbrite link is out. Uh, 
that's all for tonight. Thank you very much, Kate. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all for coming. And bye from us all uh, and uh, from myself, uh, Susie, Sarah, and Lacey at Westminster Libraries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.